Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you were given up to the will of your persecutors, suffered many torments when they took off the purple robe, which was stuck to your wounds, and put upon you your own clothes. Grant that after I have put off the clothing of this body, I may be clad with the robe of perfect charity, and that I may be adorned with your merit, and through your mercy be introduced as an adopted son into the heavenly inheritance. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who in the midst of reproach and injury bore your cross with excessive pain on your sacred and cut shoulders. Wearied and panting for breath, you toiled exceedingly under its heavy weight. Give me grace to take hold of the cross of self-denial with ardent devotion, and to imitate with the most fervent of charity the example of your virtues, and to follow you in humility even unto death. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you were led from the city with two thieves, did not refuse to be pressed upon and thrust, hastened and to be afflicted in many ways. Draw me after you, that I may quickly follow. Grant that for your sake I may entirely deny, forsake, and go out of myself. Give me grace to think of you alone and to find no joy except in you, my Redeemer. Grant that I may love you alone and may return love for love. May I earnestly seek after you and live to you alone. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when bowed down by the weight of your cross, at length reached the place of punishment, where, offered e quite exhausted, they offered you wine mingled with gold. May you extinguish in me all gluttonous and carnal desire, giving me grace never to consent to any impure or unlawful pleasure. But may I take my food in moderation to the glory of your name and may hunger and thirst after you alone and find no pleasure or gladness except in you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who was stripped before the gaze of all people on Mount Calvary, and the soreness of your wounds being increased by the removal of your clothing. You did not refuse to undergo for my sake the most dreadful pain. Grant that I may love the spirit of poverty, and never be disturbed by want or scarcity. Give me grace to bear patiently any difficulties or troubles in this life, for the glory of your name. Strip my heart of every vain fancy and affection, and grant me a holy intent with pious desires, renewing within me daily a most pure love for yourself. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who gave himself up to be extended naked upon the wood of the cross and the joints of your most holy limbs to be wrenched apart, most cruelly nailed and fastened thereto. Then for my sake you suffered your most delicate hands and feet to be most deeply wounded. Grant, O Lord, that I might remember with a faithful and grateful heart this your unspeakable charity when you did of your own accord stretch out your hands to be bored and your feet to be pierced through. O Lord, enlarge and extend my heart by a perfect love of you. Pierce it and fix it to yourself with the nail of your sweetest love and shut up within yourself alone all my senses, all my thoughts and all my affections. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
reading from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 5. If I testify about myself, then my testimony is not true. But there is another who testifies about me, and I know the testimony he testifies about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. I do not accept human testimony, but I say this to you, that you may be saved. He was a lamp that was burning and shining, and you wanted to rejoice greatly for a short time in his light. But I have a testimony greater than that from John, for the deeds that the Father has assigned to me to complete, the deeds that I am now doing, testify about me that the Father has sent me. The Father who has sent me has himself testified about me. You people have never heard his voice or seen his form at any time, nor do you have his word residing in you, because you do not believe the one whom he sent. You study the scriptures thoroughly, because you think in them you will possess eternal life. And it is these same scriptures that testify about me, but you are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. I do not accept praise from people, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. If someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe if you accept praise from another? and don't seek the praise that comes from the only God. Do not suppose that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have placed your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. But if you do not believe what Moses wrote, how will you believe my words? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is evident that the failure of many people to find Christ is not from any shortcoming in the means of discovering him. It is this which our Lord so emphatically refers to in the case of the Jews. They had the scriptures, and for a profession they searched them. They had the mine and they dug in the mine in the quest of eternal riches. They not only venerated, but they also almost worshipped the sacred volumes. With privileges far less than the mass of professing Christians have now, they improved them far more. And yet, after all, they failed. Multitudes of those who researched the scriptures failed to find Christ, or if they found him, found him only in order to reject him. This failure does not arise from a want of intelligence, from the right understanding in the use of the means. Let us observe the case of the Jews. We have seen how they searched the oracles of divine truth, and let us now observe the views which which they searched them. You search the scriptures, said Christ, because in them you think you have eternal life. They so, in this way, sought the right thing, and they looked in the right place. How many Bible readers today are there of whom even this much can be said? Surely we may ask if the Pharisees and scribes of those degenerate and unhappy days, were not nearer the kingdom of heaven than many of ourselves. Note then the true reason for the failure of these men. The evil lay in the will. You are not willing, said Christ, to come to me that you might have eternal life. It is a moral perversity, but not an intellectual defect. Not a want of light, but a want of love. And the reason for this unwillingness is twofold. The fleshly nature of the heart, 
by nature and by habit, we live immersed in the things of sense. At home, amongst the things outward, material, material, tangible, we with difficulty rise to any concept or contemplation of things spiritual and unseen. And secondly, we have a love of sin. We instinctively feel that we cannot come to Jesus and live in his divine and holy fellowship and yet live in sin. They feel that there is a natural and eternal incompatibility between the two things. They may come to Jesus just as they are, but they cannot abide with Jesus just as they are. Therefore he and they remain strangers forever. We should take from this the preciousness of the Bible as a means of leading us to Christ, but also the worthlessness of the Bible if it does not lead us to Christ. Men, before regeneration that apart from the salvation of God, are in a state which Jesus counts and calls death. With this remark of the Saviour, the true condition of sinners is seen with clear distinction. There is no room left here for dispute or mistake. In the bosom of the Father, Jesus knows the mind of God. He sees the end from the beginning. In the foreground of time, he declares that death is man's character. With his eye on eternity, he pronounces that death will be their doom. If we remain to the last where we are found at first, we shall be lost forever. In order to pass from death into life, it is necessary for us to come to Jesus. The lost must wrench themselves away from a whole legion of possessing spirits and come to Jesus as simply and as really as the cured demoniac came, to sit at his feet, to take off the old man, and to put on Christ is as real as to take off and put on garments that are clean, and as great in its results as to put off this mortal and put on the immortal. In order to have life, nothing more is needed than to come to Jesus. No qualifications are demanded. No selection of person according to merit is made. None are excluded for the presence of one quality or the absence of another. To the dead one thing only is essential, that they should come to Christ. Those who are spiritually dead are not willing to come to Christ for life. This seems strange. Even the Lord himself wondered at their unbelief. It is the very mystery of iniquity that man's resistance to the divine proposal is great in proportion to the easiness of its terms. Jesus complains that men will not come to him for life. It follows from this, as clear and sure as the reflection of your face in a mirror, that he delights to give, to be eternal life to the lost. Here the Saviour opens his heart, that we may look in and see the love that fills it. I do not know of any passage of Scripture where the compassion of Jesus flows more freely. When interpreted correctly, this is more consoling than any promise, more solemnizing than any terror. When Jesus tells us what grieves him, we learn with certainty what would make him glad. The inference is infallible. No truth can be more plain or more sure than this, that the flight of sinners to himself for life is the chief delight of God our Saviour. Jesus asks that they disregard what the, he said about himself but attended to what John the Baptist had had to say about him previously. His observation in verse 31 shows a great humility on his part. 
reducing himself to a mere man, because it is well considered that all men are liars. Psalm 116, 11. As our love of ourselves is greater than our love of the truth. The words of Jesus, however, were of course absolutely true, but he wishes to reduce the value of his own evidence in the hope that they may pay more heed to the words of John, an independent witness whom they had revered. Having made this observation and reminding them that John, who they accepted as a prophet, had confirmed every word that he had said of himself, Jesus returned to his case and pointed out that he spoke with an authority far greater than that of John. And if they consider the validity of what he is claiming, they should look no further than what he is doing and saying. However, his critics were too far, far too wrapped up in their own self-importance to be able to accept a word of what he was saying to them. They are convicted by their love of learning, because they fail to understand the true meaning of what it is that they have learnt. Jesus quoted from Moses and condemned them by their own stupidity. For on the one hand, they accept the teaching of Moses, but on the other hand, they cannot accept what he taught. For he spoke of the Messiah, and now that they are confronted by him, they fail to recognise or accept him. What then was the good of all their learning and their study of the scriptures, if, when the prophecies unfold before their very eyes, they fail to accept it? This is a very real and present danger that many of us can fall into. There is nothing wrong at all with the love of studying our Bibles. Indeed, it is our spiritual food and something that we should do constantly. However, we need to remember that we have to have Jesus living in our hearts, as well as a knowledge of Jesus in our brain. If we fail to accept Jesus into our heart, then we cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit and receive the grace of God. We will end up like the people Jesus was addressing in this passage. Overly educated, but spiritually sterile, unable, as it were, to distinguish a tree from the forest. Let us pray. O God, our refuge and strength, who is the author of all godliness, be ready, we beseech you, to hear the devout prayers of your Church. Grant that those things which we ask faithfully, we may obtain effectually. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.